Welcome to Tested, everybody. Adam here, and by the uh, fact that there are two things here in the shop, you know what we're going to talk about. There's a spacesuit, and spacesuit fellow enthusiast Ryan Nagata is with me. Um, Ryan, do you want to talk about what we have here? Because it's a pretty special and amazing piece. Uh, yeah, this is my latest project. Um, this is a replica of Alan Eustace's uh, world record uh, skydive pressure suit. Uh, that he wore when he went up higher than anybody into the stratosphere and and was uh, dropped. A lonely, uh, lonely, long free fall drop. Right. In this. Yeah. Well, in uh, in uh, an exact, this is an exact replica of the suit he went in, but it's not just a replica, is it? Um, no, it's not. This uh, I can't take credit for a lot of this <laughs> because it's, um, the cover layer is actual um, ILC made cover layer. It's not the one that he did the jump with, but it was a spare. And ILC, uh, is, to be clear, is uh, International Latex Corporation. They, these are the guys that built the original Apollo suits. Yeah, they, they built spacesuits, and they built a special custom-made suit for his jump. Oh. Um, and Alan uh, contacted me about doing this project and making a replica of the suit that he wore. And uh, they sent me a lot of parts, like the cover layers. So, yeah. So did you um, do it, you built an internal framework for this? Yeah, so this was like exactly like taxidermy. So there was oh. just like this, this uh, skin, <laughs> right. and there was a couple of hard parts, like this frame right. and the, the bubble on the outside. And I, I made a replica of the suit that goes inside, just to give it like the right structure. Mass and weight. Yeah. Uh, can it be worn? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was kind of my... Uh, my that, inspiration that was, was, was something that you could wear as a as a costume. So it has uh, it has this. These are the same brand of boots that, yeah. that he wore. Um, these are um, actually like uh, Everest mountaineering boots. Oh really? Yeah. So there were a lot of off the shelf items like yeah. these these warming gloves and mm -hmm. stuff that he used. Um, and. Uh, what was it like, I mean, given how many replicas you've made where you've examined pictures and even original artifacts, it must have been pretty cool to work with stuff made by the actual company. Yeah, that's why I did it, because <laughs> typically I, I do vintage spacesuits mm -hmm, like Mercury mm -hmm. and Apollo stuff, um, but this is cutting edge. This was, I think, 2014 when this suit was made. Um, so it was a rare opportunity for me to you know, examine Ortho fabric, which is you which know, is what, what the outer shell is made. Yeah, of. which is what the space shuttle or uh, ISS EMU is made out of. Can you describe uh, what ortho fabric is? And it's it's it's, te it's a Teflon coated. I, there's several plastics involved. I right. think there's Kevlar in it and and all kinds of other stuff. And it feels very um, slick. It feels. Yeah, it's it's tough. And yeah. it, it has kind of a, a slick feel. Um, I don't know that much about the technical stuff, but. Um, if I ever want to make like a, an EMU suit, mm -hmm. it was a really good opportunity to, to, to see study how it gets the fabric together. and how they, they construct everything because there's so many um, like pieces in the torso just so it could conform to the pressure garment inside perfectly. It's, it's, uh, the anthropomorphic it's really kind of a, pressure yeah, garment. It's really kind of a marvel to see how, uh, how it was put together. Is there, uh, is there some specific aspect about this that was the most surprising or that gave you the most education in how a spacesuit gets built or the philosophy of the making of a spacesuit? Um, let me think here. <laughs> I mean, it might just be in the, the number of pieces it took to get it to conform. Yeah, actually, one interesting discovery that I didn't know before was that... Um, there's many layers to this cover layer. Right. So there's a there's so like the a, cover layer isn't just a single. No, it, this is just the the outermost layer, but there's a there's a liner inside, mm -hmm. um, and the liner follows the exact same pattern that the outer layer did. So oh. I wasn't I was never quite sure if the liners that they did, you know, reflected the pattern exactly, and it right. does. Oh, nice. Like so, it's it's it was kind of interesting to see, and um, there's like a a batting layer in it too because. Um, uh, Alan went up very high and uh, it's cold up there. It's very cold, <laughs> and so it, this thing is. I, I tried putting it on. It's, it's literally the warmest thing that I've ever put on in my life. <laughs> well, so we also have a treat here, which is uh, not just you and the suit, but we have the man who commissioned this suit from you. We have Alan Uses. Yeah. Alan, come on in. <laughs> oh, great. So, Alan, you actually wore one of these and looked down upon Earth from how far up? 
135,890 feet. How long did you free fall for? Four minutes, 27 seconds. And you, you broke the speed of sound. Right, the top speed was 822 miles an hour, which is Mach 1.22, <laughs> and it was exactly in this style of suit. I how, mean, this how outer layer was exactly yeah. the, you know, what was against the wind on the way down. So it's incredible. It's a great job to basically oh, recreate this. Do you have, um, do you have, are you, is it bringing back some sense memories it of is, that actually, the whole project? It is, you know, there's so many little aspects of the, of the suit that it comes back. I mean, this is actually one of the helmets that I wore and it's got the oxygen mask here that well, we used. This is used. your comms helmet for, this, oh, okay. This was two things at the same time. It was a brilliant design, really. This, this bubble inside of it is 100% oxygen. Okay. Okay, so why did I need an oxygen mask? Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's not obvious why you need an oxygen mask. But this is not an oxygen mask. It's kind of the reverse of an oxygen mask. There's a little flapper valve here mm -hmm. that when I breathe in, it basically just opens this flapper valve and the oxygen from this bubble basically supplies me with oxygen. What it is, is the oxygen mask when I breathe out. It allows takes you to vent carbon dioxide. A carbon dioxide and it vents to the lower half of the suit. There's a ring around my neck that is called the neck dam and it's like a, a you know a tie kind of right, thing. Right, right, right. And by venting in the lower half, all the carbon dioxide goes to the lower half of the suit so I don't have to worry about carbon dioxide right. poisoning. But even more importantly, all the moisture goes to the lower half of the suit. And so this environment right here can't possibly ice up or any of those things, which is another real danger that you have in things. So this, you know, when I see this, I remember that, you know, this amazing architecture. And the helmet really isn't to protect me, although it's nice to have. It actually but says it's there's really... a sticker on the inside that says not to be used as a protective device. Yeah, but they do, they do that for everything, right? The skateboarders are doing these huge right. things and their helmets probably say the same thing. Uh, but. Uh, but anyway, its main purpose was to basically hold the oxygen mask in place. And now there's all kinds of things like, how do you itch your nose in a spacesuit? Well, it how? turns out it's like a, this is like hard, right? But what you do is you actually take this thing and you push it out until the oxygen mask hits the inside of that thing, <laughs> and then you use it to rub your nose. So I mean, there's tons of like fun things about this wow. uh, this whole thing. But anyway, it's so fun to it's so fun to see it and. Everyone, like this little button here is a, is a heater for the gloves. I mean, they're pretty standard he, uh, gloves yeah. off the shelf, and then the heater has like low, medium, and high, but the problem is how do, you make, how do you initiate that? Because since there's this big thing on front, you can't actually get the two arms to touch each other. Oh, you, really? I can't, you know, you don't do that. So we actually had this tiny little thing on the side that, that you was could use to especially machine basically for me to be able to take an arm and push that button. Oh my gosh. So anyway. And you, you didn't just wear the suit to do the jump. You actually trained in this suit. You did all sorts of different we did tons preliminary. tons of tests in the suit. The, the most grueling was a test that we way over designed, which is to try to deal with the cold that's associated with the stratosphere. So the stratosphere, you know, it gets really, it gets colder and colder until you get up to the tropopause and then, uh, and then it gets progressively warmer as you go through the stratosphere. And when you get to the top of the stratosphere, it actually gets colder again. So this, you know, the, the whole atmosphere is really a big temperature inversion hmm. is how it works. And so, but it gets super cold, like minus 120 degrees Fahrenheit or something, that kind of thing. Right. So we decided, okay, well, we're gonna need to test that. Right. So we, we got a freezer, I mean a, a walk-in freezer. That could go that cold? Well, what we did was we hooked up a liquid nitrogen tank to it <laughs> with a big handle on it and then tons of sensors and fans inside to rotate it. And, but it turns out that was like way overkill because it is true that as you go really high, it gets really cold. Right. But there's also so few oxygen mole molecules up there and they're moving really slowly. I mean, the, the, the atmosphere, those molecules are moving slowly, but they're so far apart that they don't conduct. So you actually, I actually- Oh, so it's like there's no thermal transfer because there's, there's no not enough molecules. There's no thermal transfers, exactly. Wow. And that's the beauty of it. Once I got to like 70,000 feet, I mean, it's cold, but not very cold. Yeah. But once I got 70,000 feet, we turned off the heaters. I actually was in thermal equilibrium the entire way up. But in the test, in this freezer, I was so cold, and we had to do the test like four <laughs> times. And by the, by the I mean, I, I had frostbite, you know, kind of little frostbite, oh not big frostbite, because we stopped the test, but yeah. 
Then we had one case where the, you know, I said, remember I said that all the moisture goes to the lower half? Yeah. And the way these suits work, which I didn't know, you blow them up from the inside. It's not that somebody pressurizes the suit and it blows up around you. When I'm in the suit, I blow it up. So your exhaling is My actually actively pressurizing, the pressurizing. And once it gets up to 5.4 psi, which you think, I mean, that's a huge amount of pressure. Yeah. Of you know, per square inch, 5.4 pounds per every square inch. It only takes like a minute or two minutes. That's it. To pressurize it from internal breathing, and it gets bigger and bigger, and it's like a balloon going up around you, and uh, you know, it's it's just a blast. But. Once it was pressurized, there's wet air in here. Right. I'm in a freezing environment, and once it gets to 5.4, there's a vent here that's basically venting out to keep it at 5.4 uh, psi. Don't you well, need a spigot on the ankle to let out the water? That's the problem, is water <laughs> comes out of this, and in one test, we actually had icing you wow. know, so coming out, which blocked that valve. And then we had to, you know, there's a safety valve too, but we had to end the test. So anyway, we figured out how to solve all those problems. But anyway, thank you for the memories. Oh, this is welcome. wonderful. Thank you for well, the so opportunity. If this is the replica. Where is the original suit that you it's wore? It's in the Smithsonian Air and Space oh. Museum at uh, Dulles. And it's got a beautiful, beautiful uh, enclosure for it. It's all plexiglass around it. It's in a, you know, uh, a perfect environment to save the spacesuits for long periods of time. And, do you go uh, see it to say hi occasionally? I do say hi occasionally. <laughs> and it, it's so funny because here's a suit that I spent a ton of time in. You yeah. know, I mean, uh, I mean, probably a hundred hours in the suit. And I, I, you know, if anybody remembers my landings, I kind of crashed and burned on landing because you can't land in a suit that weighs, you know, with you 435 pounds. And there's no articulation here on either on, on the waist. So. And you know the legs only go back like that, so you're gonna fall when you hit. But anyway, I had all these crash and burns. But when I go and see it, I like they won't even let me. Kind of, I, I have to wear special gloves just to go up and touch it. Really? And, oh yeah, even me, I can't do it. And we were at this little shooting one time, and I was touching, you know, just feeling it and stuff like that. And then somebody else said, said, you know, hey, can I do that? And the, the, I mean, the curators just looked at it like with aghast and said, no, and the only person who allowed to touch it is the one that gave it to us. So anyway, it's that super is, cool. That is really, really amazing. And uh, it must have felt amazing to wear, uh, to work with the guys that made the original Apollo spacesuits. Oh, ILC is wonderful. They have, you know, here's the people that designed all the historic suits for Apollo, EVA, space shuttle. I mean, all of these suits, uh, and they're built to work pressurized. That's what's different between right. them. I mean, all these things, you actually have to pressurize the suit and get work done. Whereas, you know, some of the other suits are depressurized and in an emergency you can pressurize mm -hmm. them. Like so, the orange shuttle suit or the original exactly. Mercury suit. They're these just are for emergency. working suits uh, and you can do things in it. And so, and it was it was amazing because I put brought my suit in there and, uh, and we were looking at it and, um, you know, we went through it and they love it because this is a brand new suit. Same thing that you said. Here's the most modern materials mm -hmm. and things like that in perfect condition and with all the parts and stuff. But they said, Alan, we have a surprise for you. And, and uh, I said, what, what is it? And then they, they take me over to another table and they pull off it and here's Neil Armstrong's suit right in front of me. You know, Good. and I'm not allowed to touch that suit, <laughs> no. by the way. No gloves, anything. I'm, but, but I can get really close to it like this. And you know, you got to see like, you know, the, he had checklists that were on the back of a glove. Yeah. And, and the amazing thing is the architecture, like you said, is almost identical. Mm -hmm. right. You look at the valves, they're in the same places, the, the neck rings are the same, the same articulation on the wrist, and then you feel like you're part of history. Amazing. I, I really appreciate you letting us cover this for Tested and letting us see it. And Ryan, as always, it's just amazing work. Thank you guys. Oh, Thank you no. very much. It's a pleasure. Right. Ah, so uh, you're gonna, you, you wanna put this on and jump off the roof? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did I ever tell you the NASA story? No. So, okay, so right. here's, here's what happened. So ILC, we're doing this, this whole thing with ILC Dover and you know, they're coming in, they're building the suit and all this stuff for me and it's, it's great. And at the same time, in the background, NASA is worried about the durability of their suits. Right. And so they're designing special rooms and special carpet and padding and all this kind of stuff to deal with these suits because they're very expensive and they're very precious yeah. and they thought they were easily damaged. 
Meanwhile, I'm landing, doing front flips, <laughs> crashing, throwing out of things, and all those kinds of suits. And these suits are incredibly durable. Matter of fact, it's interesting. This suit, the suit that I wore on my last jump was actually tighter in terms of leakage rates than when it first arrived. That I, It got tighter over time. Yeah, well, what happens is, you know, the air goes out and there's little pieces of particulates and stuff that actually plug all the leaks. So mm -hmm. it's, it oh. makes sense that it gets mm. better over time. Wow. But it, it actually got to be a tighter suit the longer I used it. And I was putting it through like incredible, in, you, know, uh, you know, turmoil. And then, but ILC couldn't tell NASA about this because they, they were under confidentiality agreements. And so they tried to like give hints to them that says, <laughs> this suit is actually more durable than you think it is. <laughs> you probably don't need to go to all this extra expense to have these wonderful rooms. And then after the jump was done, they showed the NASA guys the films of all these backflips and said, anyway, they didn't need any padding. These, these suits are incredibly durable. Ah, oh, beautiful.